Hi folks, this video is all about cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and I'll tell you all about them, uh, which is one of the most prevalent and important security vulnerabilities that exists at the moment. Uh, in a separate video, I uh, will talk about how you prevent it and um, probably also record a video with some examples of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are um, a form of code injection. So there are a number of vulnerabilities that fall under this broad umbrella, and we'll talk about them further in, in other topics, but that includes things like SQL injection. But, but in either case, you've got some code and that you're injecting in some other code that gets run. Um, and so you've just like, you, you've got some malicious code, the attacker has some malicious code, and they're managing to get that to run somewhere where it's not supposed to run. So in the case of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you've got some um, attacking code <clears throat> and you manage to somehow get it mixed into the website that gets served up to uh, a victim. And so you, as the attacker, get some code running inside someone else's web browser. And then that code can misbehave. It can have severe security consequences and we'll talk about what those are. So CVEs is, um, you know, which we've covered elsewhere, but basically uh, the common vulnerabilities and exposures is a way that um, publicly disclo disclosed or um, vulnerabilities or those that are in the process of being publicly disclosed are uh, given like a, a tracking number. Um, and generally speaking, you won't get CVEs for every bug that gets found in every website. So this doesn't include um, like if you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability in one specific website, um, if you try and register that as a CVE, it, they won't give you a CVE number for it um, unless it's kind of like infrastructure. So like a well-known um, server that happens to be using web technology um, or if it's just very, very high profile, you might get a CVE for it. But generally speaking, you, you know, when companies are getting penetration tests and security audits and they find cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, they're not going to be given CVEs. So this is just kind of like the highest profile stuff really, or the things that, that are going to affect the most number of people. So how many CVEs have been registered that are cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the last three months? Well, um, a lot. So there are almost 500 um, CVEs, and if you look here at the dates, um, this is today's date, there's one that's already been published uh, today, um, at, you know, early in the morning, and there, you know, you can see that, you know, basically every day there are new security vulnerabilities discovered, and there's lots, lots of them are uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So, um, and you can see here there's things like cPanel, which is you know used to to manage the deployment of um, websites. Uh, you know, incredibly um, prevalent software um, and things like Webmin and like a React editor and things like that. So you know, there's there's a lot. Basically, what I'm saying is it's very very prevalent um, and there's a lot a lot of security vulnerabilities that are discovered. In fact, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities is the most prevalent kind of security vulnerability um, at the moment. So if you look back in time, and that's kind of captured by this, um, these data points that are on the slide, on the slide there, if you can, um, if you can squint and see, see it. Uh, basically, um, buffer overflows used to be the most prevalent kind of security vulnerability. Um, in fact, you know, not long ago, it's, you know, what I would have said is buffer overflow is the most common security vulnerability that exists. And that's partly because a lot of code, well, still a lot of code is written in C and C++, um, but those languages are very, it's very easy to write code that is vulnerable to a buffer overflow. Just like now, things and the, you know, webification and more and more things being built, built on web technologies, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are very prevalent using those technologies. And therefore, you kind of see the rise in cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And yeah, so that surpassed the, num the number of buffer overflows. So basically, how um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities work 
is that the website ends up getting this malicious content mixed in with the original website. And so the attacker manages to get some JavaScript, uh, typically, that is ended up getting injected into the web page that is served up to a victim. And then their JavaScript, the attacker's JavaScript, this malicious code runs inside their web browser and is able to do things. So, you know, we talked in the previous topic about JavaScript security, but basically there's, you know, there's not a lot. Once, the Java, once you've got JavaScript actually running on a website, you know, at that stage, the JavaScript can access like everything inside that page. And so if you manage to get your JavaScript loaded up, it can access the page content so anything that is on that page displayed to the user, the JavaScript can see. Um, the JavaScript can access all of the kind of like hidden information, like cookies and session information, which means, um, you know, they can basically pull out that stuff that has huge security consequences we'll talk about in a second. Um, it, basically, anything the page contains or does, the JavaScript can drive. So JavaScript can drive clicks on things can just access the content of anything that's in there. Um, and so, yeah, anything can be altered um, or sent to the attacker by the script. So, you know, this means that you can result in session hijacking. So if the JavaScript um, just accesses the cookies, um, more often than not, uh, in fact, almost always, I would say, the, um, the session cookies are available to the JavaScript. And the session cookie, as we talked about in the sessions, um, you know, lecture kind of topic um, last week, the the cookies um, are the only thing that is um, used to define whether or not someone is. So they say, you know, someone has access to that active session. So you know, just briefly, a user authenticates themselves to the web browser, web server. Web server says, yeah, fine, we know you are who you say you are. You know, here's a session ID, and that establishes a cookie that then gets sent along each time by the user. And then each time the user you know, accesses the page, that cookie set says, you know, this is the session that's happening at the moment. And if attacker manages to steal that cookie, they can then start sending that cookie along, and now they're logged in as the victims um, on that server. So you know, it's quite possible that either temporarily or if the attacker is able to change a password, for example, they can result in account takeover, um, either just while that session exists or potentially the attacker will try and take over the account, um, you know, permanently, depending on what they can do um, with access to the website. Um, so you also can result in disclosure of sensitive or personal data. So anything that's inside the web page displayed to the user, uh, the malicious script can access. The malicious script can drive further actions that might not even be displayed to the user, can just in the background start accessing other pages, um, can even start listening to keystrokes and all sorts of things, uh, you know, while you're in, while the victim is on that page. Um, can start performing actions, um, as if on behalf of the victim, like driving behavior of the of interactions with that website, can modify the content on the page. So content spoofing, so just like um, lie about things. So, you know, if you had a bank balance you're displaying to the user, you could show anything. You could make it look like they have more or less money than they actually have in the bank account, and the victim will just, you know, see whatever the attacker wants them to see, basically. Um, Redirect them to other malicious servers, for example, or other websites. Sh start showing ads. You know, could be a way. You know, is one way of making money is basically serving up ads within um, the victim's web browser, um, and potentially, depending on the kind of cross-site scripting vulnerability that it is, it could apply to all users that visit that website. There are three kinds of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So three basically different ways that an attacker can get malicious code into someone's web browser. Um, and the 
and it depends on the kinds of programming mistakes that gets made by the developers of the server, basically. So one of the kinds of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities is non-persistent, which is also known as reflected cross-site scripting or type 2 cross-site scripting. And this is basically where the um, there's nothing stored on the servers, um, but there is a way for an attacker to basically get the victim to send along a request that includes the script. Um, and so the victim is tricked into basically sending the script to the server. Uh, and one way you can do that is via a URL that can contain some malicious content. Uh, and there are ways that you can kind of disguise the malicious content using different kind of encoding me methods and things like that. Basically, you get this long uh, link that looks like, you know, garbage. You manage to trick the user into clicking that link, and that link will send along to the server the attack code or the actual like script that the attacker wants to run. Um, and that code then gets echoed back by the server back to the client, back to the victim again, basically. So the victims accidentally sent along the script to the server and the server just like plays it back to the victim. Um, but now you have that script running inside that web um, site that's been served up by the, by the server uh, with that malicious code running inside it. So the, um, the attack has worked and the attack has managed to um, you know, get their malicious code running inside the website um, site. Uh, so yeah, so for example, you send along in the, in the request, in the URL, um, link the actual like parameters that get echoed back to the user. Uh, and basically, if the server echoes back the input into the in, directly into the HTML without doing sanitization, then that's when this code injection is um, you know, going to be possible. So usually the attacker will send the link to the victim like via email or an instant message or whatever. Um, and often they can look like innocent looking URLs um, that, you know, basically um, is going to point to that um, trusted server. Because, you know, you can have the, the actual URL starts with the domain name of the server that you trust. So facebook.com or whatever. And if Facebook have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, that is a non-persistent one, then this kind of attack can work where you, you know, send this link along, they click it, and then that information gets sent along to Facebook, which then could get echoed back to the user. Um, but one of the um, side effects of this kind of attack, nothing's actually stored on the server other than in logs, because it's just echoing back to the victim, the thing that the victim sent along to the server. So another category of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are persistent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, also known as stored cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, or type 1 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And that's where there's a like a like um, somewhere where the attacker can put something onto the website. So for example, in a comment box um, where you can enter some um, something that all the users see. Um, but if it's not being properly escaped and sanitized, um, the attacker can put some actual JavaScript in there that gets loaded and run every time anyone um, accesses the web page. Um, so it happens when the server stores input that is later echoed to other users without proper validation or sanitization. Um, and so, you know, you can send malicious scripts to the server, which gets stored, you know, potentially in a database, like in a, um, I don't know, like in a, in, in a chat, history or in a you know forum you know in the comments or you know whatever it's stored in the database of the server itself and then it gets fed to the victims every time someone visits the website potentially um, and so stored cross-site scripting vulnerabilities can affect all the users of a website at once basically every time anyone accesses the page compared to um, the uh, reflected cross-site scripting where you you know need them the victim to actually click on a link so server-side, um, th those things that I've been talking about are all kind of server-side vulnerabilities in that um, you're interacting with a server that's happening on a server. There's another kind of less prevalent but emerging kind of cross-site scripting vulnerability 
which is DOM based. Um, and so when you have these kind of client side um, websites like single page apps that are built on React and Angular or Vue and you know these kinds of things where you have lots of JavaScript framework stuff that is most of the um, uh, behavior moves to the client, then it's possible to start trying to inject um, code directly into those client-side um, applications. Uh, and so you can direct cross-site scripting against the client logic as opposed to against the server logic. Um, and so there have been examples of jQuery plugins that have been vulnerable in this way. So those um, that's an overview of um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, and I'll record some separate videos with some uh, examples and how you um, prevent it.